Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Kim Wilcoxon. I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Beth Mandel, who will be joining me today. We are both uh, part of the Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Practice Group here at the Cincinnati office of Thompson Hine. Today's webinar is the first in a series of two. Uh, for the next hour, we'll provide an overview of ARPA's COBRA subsidy premium provisions, guidance recently issued by the DOL, including model notices, and the interaction between COBRA subsidies and the outbreak period deadline extensions. We'll also highlight a number of remaining open questions. Our second webinar, which will be on April 28th, 2021, will focus on additional guidance that we expect or hope the IRS will provide by then. Uh, in the meantime, we will discuss today what you should be aware of as you move forward, uh, but please consider attending the April 28th webinar where we hope to have much more concrete information from the IRS. Uh, we encourage you to put your questions today in the chat box located on the right-hand side of the GoToMeeting screen, and we'll address them with whatever time we have remaining at the end of today's presentation. Uh, to proactively answer a question we always get, yes, you will get copies of the slides. The copies of the slides and the webinar will be sent within two business days of today. Uh, so thank you for your interest, and we're now going to begin with an overview of the subsidies. The American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, provides a full COBRA subsidy from April 1, 2021 through September 30, 2021 for certain subsidy eligible individuals. Now this is going to include all group health plans, which means medical, dental, and vision, uh, EAP, if you apply COBRA to your EAP, but not healthcare FSAs. It also does include both federal COBRA and comparable state continuation. Now the way this works is that subsidy eligible individuals pay nothing for their coverage and then the employer or the insurance company recoups the cost of the program through a payroll tax credit. Now, who is a subsidy eligible individual? Well, generally we're looking at individuals who lost health coverage due to a reduction in hours or an involuntary termination of employment for reasons other than gross misconduct. Now, what we learned from the Department of Labor in their guidance is that, as we thought, reductions in hours don't have to be involuntary. So we're looking at changes in business hours of operation, you know, changes from full-time to part-time status, whether that was initiated by the employer or the employee, temporary leaves of absence or lawful labor strikes. If, if any of those reductions in hours caused a loss of coverage, we've got a potential subsidy eligible individual. Uh, what we don't know at this point in time is who's considered involuntarily terminated. Uh, you know, for example, somebody who dies. Are they considered to have involuntarily terminated employment? Um, we have some guidance from 2009 when we had COBRA subsidies back in 2009. We expect the IRS to sort of follow a lot of that guidance and answer questions like that, in which case death would not be considered an involuntary termination. Um, but we're waiting on the IRS to provide that guidance. Uh, in addition, a subsidy eligible individual must be a qualified beneficiary. So that would mean that domestic partners are not subsidy eligible individuals and coverage that's provided to a domestic partner would then not therefore be eligible for these subsidies. And something to keep in mind with respect to the domestic partner issue is that the model notices that were issued by the DOL don't actually include any information about domestic partners um, and don't specify that domestic partners are not going to be eligible for the subsidy. So when your employees are filling out these forms, trying to register, as um, subsidy eligible, they may be registering their dependents, including a domestic partner, thinking, okay, that person is going to be eligible for the subsidy as well. They may not expecting then to be, you know, that they'll be getting a bill for that person's portion of the premium. Um, so when you are looking to prepare your notices to the extent that you are able to, you might want to think about adding in some information about domestic partners if, um, if you do, in fact, provide domestic partner coverage. Great point. Thanks, Beth. Uh, now, let's talk about, in, in, in addition to being eligible for COBRA for the right reasons, in order to be eligible for the subsidy, someone cannot be eligible for other employer-provided group health plan coverage or Medicare. Uh, and individuals will have an obligation to notify the plan as to whether they are eligible for this other coverage. And if they fail to notify the plan, they're subject to a tax penalty, generally $250, unless that 
failure to notify the plan was willful or fraudulent, in which case it could be up to 110% of the subsidy they took when they weren't eligible to do so. And the notices that we provide to individuals, which we'll talk about a little bit later, do highlight the fact that there is an obligation to notify the plan and they do provide information about the tax penalty. Now the group health plan coverage that disqualifies someone from the subsidy does not include standalone dental coverage, standalone vision coverage, or other coverage that's considered accepted benefits like on-site medical clinics, uh, a qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangement, flexible spending accounts, Medicaid, and individual market coverage. Those will not disqualify someone from the subsidy. And it's important to make a, a, a distinction between subsidy eligibility and COBRA eligibility. So someone may lose eligibility for the subsidy because they're eligible for other coverage or eligible for Medicare, but they continue to be eligible for COBRA. Now, if they're on COBRA and they become enrolled in Medicare or another group health plan, they would lose COBRA coverage. And Kim, I might just jump in here too also because I think there's been some confusion because the, um, the group health plans that are eligible for the subsidy don't necessarily neatly line up with you know, what's excluded for this other group health plan coverage. And so it's, um, you know, if, you have, uh, if, you, if you've got major medical and, and dental and um, you're seeking a COBRA subsidy for that continued coverage and you're also eligible for other major medical coverage, you're not gonna be eligible for a subsidy, um, for a COBRA subsidy. But if you've got other, if, you, if you're eligible for other dental coverage, not major medical coverage, you're still going to be eligible for a COBRA subsidy for both the medical and dental that you're receiving through COBRA. So it doesn't neatly line up and there's been some confusion, just something to be aware of. Great. So in addition to being eligible for COBRA for the right reasons, in addition to not being eligible for other group health plan coverage or Medicare, we are looking at a, at a universe of individuals who either are on COBRA now or would be on COBRA now if they had elected it when it was available to them and carried it all the way through, or if they hadn't dropped it. So for those folks who elected it in the past, dropped it, you know, if they could be on COBRA right now, they could be eligible for the subsidy. So these folks who aren't currently on COBRA, we're calling second chance individuals. And for them, there's actually a new opportunity for them to re-enroll in COBRA coverage. So they have to meet four criteria. They have to have lost coverage due to a reduction in hours or an uh, involuntary termination of employment prior to April 1. They had to have been entitled to COBRA coverage under federal COBRA. Uh, so state continuation does not appear to be eligible for the second chance election. They had to have either not elected COBRA or not, it, either if they had elected COBRA or not dropped it, they would be on COBRA now and they've not exceeded their maximum COBRA period. So these individuals will get prospective coverage. They do not have to elect COBRA all the way back to their loss of coverage and pay all those retroactive premiums. They can jump in and they have a choice of jumping in either April 1 or prospectively from the date they make the election. Uh, why would somebody want to get into free coverage later? than they could otherwise do. Um, we're gonna touch on that here in just a few slides. So, so put a pin in that and we'll come back. And it's important to note that these folks must make an election within 60 days after they receive notice telling them about their opportunity to make the election. And we'll talk about outbreak period extensions in a little bit, but just to highlight that the outbreak period extensions do not apply to this 60 day period. So 60 days here means 60 days. It doesn't mean 60 days plus the outbreak period. So let's go through an example to see how this would work. Uh, let's say Amy was involuntarily terminated on October 15th, 2019. So we're going back to 2019 here. Uh, and she lost coverage under a plan that was subject only to federal COBRA. So if she had elected COBRA, it would have been effective from November 1, 2019 through April 30 of 2021. And that's depicted at the bottom of the screen in the, the graphic that we have there. You can see the 18 months starts in November of 2019 and it ends at the end of April of 2021. So as long as Amy is not eligible for other group health plan coverage or Medicare on April 1, she could make an election to get into free COBRA coverage, but only for the month of April. So we're not extending the amount of COBRA coverage. We're not giving her anything in addition. We're just telling her she can get back in to finish out her COBRA coverage and do it for free while she's subsidy eligible. 
Now contrast that with, let's say Amy was uh, enrolled in a plan that was subject only to state continuation. Now she was involuntarily terminated, let's say back in 2018. Let's say New York, this is a New York plan where they have a 36 month continuation period. So here her coverage could have begun May 1, 2018 and would have ended at the end of April of 2021. So just like in our last example, she would be in her last month of coverage had she elected and carried COBRA all the way through. But because she is subject to state continuation and not federal, it appears that she is not eligible to make this second chance election. She's not eligible to jump back in. Now, I mentioned that state continuation is subject to the subsidy. So had she elected COBRA and had she continued it all the way through, her last month would be free but she doesn't have an opportunity now to jump back into COBRA. There are some open questions I think here because the Department of Labor guidance that we're gonna talk about in a minute was a little conflicting and a little confusing. So do we have to give her notice? Do we have to give folks on state continuation who are enrolled in COBRA notice about this? I think there's some open questions there, but I, I, I feel 97% confident that she would not be entitled to elect COBRA at this point in time. So that being said, as a reminder, ARPA doesn't extend. We're not giving anybody anything in addition. Although they can jump back in, we're not extending their period of COBRA coverage. And we're not protecting them for any reason that their coverage could otherwise terminate. So if they become entitled to, which means enrolled in or covered by Medicare after electing COBRA, their COBRA could be terminated and then therefore they would lose the subsidy as well. And similarly, if they commit you know, fraud or other reason why the coverage could be terminated, the subsidy is not going to protect them and keep their coverage in place. Now, one thing that ARPA did is they gave employers an opportunity, if they want to, to allow participants to switch into a lower premium option. So normally under COBRA, you're only required to give employees uh, an opportunity to continue the coverage that they were in when they had their qualifying event. Well, the ARPA is saying you could give them that coverage or you could allow them to switch down into a lower cost premium option. Now, I think that employers have always had this opportunity to you know, offer other options, um, but the DOL guidance seems to make clear that if, if you offer other IDA options and people elect up, they're not going to qualify for the subsidy. So this is an we'll we'll get to some open questions on this here in a little bit. But uh, this is this is an option. It's available to employers, but there is no obligation to allow employees to switch down into a lower cost option. Now, there will be that notice that goes out will tell employees if you decide to provide this option that they have the right to enroll down, uh, and then they will have 90 days, and that's 90 days, not 90 days plus the outbreak period, to tell you that they want to switch options. So let's talk about required notices. The ARPA created three new types of notices. One is a notice that's going to go out to uh, subsidy eligible individuals who are entitled to elect COBRA prior to April 1. So their qualifying event was prior to April 1. This notice needs to go out to that group by May 31 of this year. Uh, and so we're sending the notice out to folks who lost coverage due to a termination of employment or reduction in hours. And as we saw in that example with Amy, we're, we ha may have to go back a ways to figure out who is entitled to this notice. Then there's a modified COBRA election notice. So for those folks who have a qualifying event during the subsidy period, they're going to get the COBRA election notice that has information about the subsidy in it. And then we have a third notice. As people approach the end of the subsidy period, we're required to tell them that they're approaching the end of the subsidy period. So uh, with at least 15 days, but not more than 45 days before their subsidy expires, whether that's due to you know, it being September 30th or them reaching the end of their maximum COBRA period, we need to tell them that their subsidy is expiring and that they have other opportunities for group health plan coverage. And we do have um, models from the Department of Labor, which we'll go into in a minute. Uh, they were provided on April 7th of this year. So talk a minute about the payroll tax credit. And we're not gonna talk a lot about this because again, I think we're waiting on guidance from the IRS to really firm up how this works. But essentially, assistance eligible individuals will pay nothing for COBRA coverage for April of 2021 through September of 2021. And then for self-funded plans, the employer just simply eats that premium 
and then recoups it through a payroll tax credit. And it's a credit, it's not a deduction. So the idea being the employer will get paid back for the money that the employee did not pay. Um, it's a refundable tax credit. So even if they don't have taxes to pay, they, they're gonna get that money back. Um, question that we have is, how much money are they going to get back? How much can an employer take the credit for? Well, we know they can take a credit for the amount that the employee would otherwise be required to pay without the federal subsidy. But if an employer voluntarily subsidizes the coverage, the COBRA coverage, and an employee would be required to pay less than 102%, it's possible that an employer would only be able to take a tax credit for the difference. We're waiting on the IRS guidance to confirm. Now, for fully insured benefits, for plans that are not subject to federal COBRA, it's very clear that the insurance company is just going to eat that premium and then take the payroll tax credit to re reimburse themselves. For fully insured plans subject to federal COBRA, it appears that the employer will be required to front the premium and then recoup it through the payroll tax credit. We're also expecting the IRS guidance to address that issue as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Beth to talk a little bit about the DOL guidance that came out last week. Thanks, Kim. Yep, so as Kim mentioned, we did get DOL guidance on April 7th. Uh, the guidance includes FAQs about the COBRA subsidy, um, a summary of the COBRA premium assistance provisions, and then some model notices. So the model general notice and election notice, the model notice um, in connection with those second chance individuals, uh, model alternative notice for use um, with respect to state mini co COBRA coverage, and then model notice of expiration of premiums. Uh, the summary and all of the model forms require customization, so keep that in mind when um, preparing your notices. And then use of the model notices is not required, but the DOL did note that they consider appropriate use of the models to be good faith compliance with COBRA and ARPA. So if you do end up using the models, that'll give you a little bit level of, insur of assurance that you're in compliance. We, we hope. Yeah. <laughs> and I say that because there is a series of, you know, cases out there right now where big name employers have been sued because they weren't using the COBRA model. Um, and so the, the COBRA model notice, um, th what these law firms are alleging is that the employer refused to use the model notice because they wanted to confuse their COBRA participants, you know, scare them away from COBRA so that the employer could save money in, in not, you know, having so much COBRA coverage. Uh, and so these law firms who are bringing these suits, there's about three of them, I think, in Florida, are really nitpicking the use of model of COBRA notices that don't use the DOL model verbatim. Um, and so using this DOL model verbatim, as Beth's gonna talk about in a minute, there, I think there are some, some issues, some non-clarity with some of these models, but the more we customize it, the more we open ourselves up to these nuisance lawsuits where we're, it's being argued that we um, are, are trying to, to confuse people and scare people away from COBRA. So, um, you know, it, it, an employer should really think about to what extent will they be customizing the model? And this may be a decision that's made by your COBRA administrator uh, instead of yourself. But keep in mind, we've got that COBRA notice litigation out there. I, I think it's been slowing down and I think it's sort of the tide has turned in favor of employers, but it's something to keep in mind as you're working through these COBRA notices. Um, so we did get some answers to some of the open questions that were floating around after I uh, started to analyze ARPA. Um, one of the questions was this 2% premium um, or this 2% administrative fee that's usually tacked on to the COBRA premium. Is that also something that's going to be covered by the subsidy or that, um, or are we allowed to charge that through to participants still? And the DOL guidance did clarify that no, plans cannot charge that 2% administrative fee to participants. Um, it's still unclear, as we'll discuss later, whether plan sponsors can get a tax credit for that 2% premium assistance charge. Um, but the other issue that's going to flow from that is that if COBRA administrators are not collecting that administrative fee, they're likely still going to want that administrative fee from someone. So they may be billing that directly to the plan then. Um, 
Another open question was what happens to individuals who end up paying premiums for subsidy eligible months before they get notice of the subsidy? So you may have people who have already paid their April premium, may pay their May premium before they get these notices. And the DOL said that in those cases, um, plans can consider crediting any amounts paid toward future months. If it looks like the individual's COBRA period is going to extend beyond the subsidy period, so beyond September of this year, they could credit those payments toward months after September. The other option is to issue a refund. Um, impact of extension of deadlines due to COVID-19. So we've talked a little bit about that outbreak period. Kim mentioned that the um, the extension of deadlines that was mandated last year is not going to apply to the periods for notifying individuals of the COBRA subsidy for the period associated with electing the COBRA subsidy and for the period of notifying individuals of the termination of that subsidy or the expiration of that subsidy. Um, impact of waiting periods, uh, the DOL also clarified that um, the question of, you know, when somebody is eligible for other group health coverage that's going to make them ineligible for the COBRA subsidy, if somebody is in a waiting period for other group health coverage, they're not going to be considered eligible for that other group health coverage. So they then will be eligible for the COBRA subsidy. Right, and I think, yep, there we go. So um, additional issues that were clarified. Um, individuals who are receiving the ARPA COBRA subsidy are not going to be eligible for a health coverage tax credit or a marketplace premium tax credit. And this relates to um, something that Kim had mentioned earlier about the fact that individuals can choose whether they want to start their COBRA premium um, or COBRA subsidy coverage as of April 1 or prospectively from the date of election. And I know, you know, the, the thinking might be, why would anybody choose not to get, you know, a couple months of free coverage? But this might be one situation where somebody decides I'm going to elect for my COBRA to begin prospectively from my date of election. Because within the marketplace, you can't go, you can't terminate your marketplace coverage retroactively. So in order to avoid a situation where they have an overlap, uh, a period where they're getting both a marketplace premium tax credit and a COBRA subsidy, somebody might choose to terminate their marketplace coverage as of um, you know, April 30th or, or May 31st and start their COBRA subsidy period prospectively after that marketplace coverage has been terminated. Um, additionally, Kim talked about the fact that, that individuals have a choice, which we just discussed, whether to start that um, COBRA period at, from April 1 or prospectively from a, the date of the election. Interestingly, to further complicate things, individuals who are still within their election period, um, either within their standard election period or within an extended election period as a result of the deadline extensions announced last, last year, they're going to have a third option. They can actually choose to begin their coverage retroactively to the date that they originally lost coverage. Now, they are still going to have to pay the retroactive premiums for any period prior to April 1st of this year. So any period prior to the subsidy period, they're not going to be eligible for um, a subsidy for that, but they will have the option to start their coverage earlier. All right. Um, the subsidy expiration notice. So. Uh, Originally, I think the thinking was you're only going to have to send this expiration notice to individuals who are losing the subsidy but continuing to be eligible for COBRA. So basically, at the end of this subsidy period, um, before September 30th, you're, you'd have to notify those people so that they have noticed that they're going to have to start paying again. But it looks like from the um, from the notice from the model notice produced by the DOL that that uh, notice of subsidy expiration actually is required to be given not only at the end of the subsidy period, but also um, to anyone who's exhausting their max COBRA coverage 
during the subsidy period. So if you have someone who who's you know 18 months is up in June, you're going to have to send them this notice as well. So really, the only time you don't have to send this notice to someone whose subsidy is ending is somebody whose subsidy is ending because they became eligible for other group health plan coverage or Medicare. And that's because they have to tell the plan that they're losing eligibility for the subsidy. So there's no need for the plan to turn around and tell the person that they're losing eligibility for the subsidy. All right, and so I'll just give an overview now of some of the model forms and uh, notices that the DOL produced. So first we've got um, this document that they're calling the Summary of COBRA Premium Assistance Provisions. And that includes basically a one-page summary for participants of, of what the, um, the subsidy entails. Um, but more importantly, attached to that summary, there are two key forms. There's a request for treatment as an assistance eligible individual. This is the form that participants are actually going to have to fill out in order to basically demonstrate that they you know, uh, were involuntarily terminated, um, had a reduction in hours, and to attest to the fact that they are not eligible for other group health coverage that would render them ineligible for a subsidy. Um, so this form, as, as we'll discuss in a moment, is it's necessary to attach this to the model notices that you'll be sending out. Um, additionally, there's another form in this packet, a participant notification, and that is the form that participants are supposed to use to notify the plan if they become eligible for other group health coverage after electing the COBRA subsidy. Um, so that the plan knows, you know, as of June 30th, we're going to cut off the subsidy for this individual. All right, um, the model general notice and election form. So originally ARPA required both um, a, a, an updated general notice and an updated election form, but um, it, it was allowable or permissible for plans to send the general notice and the election form at the same time, um, rather than having to do two separate notices. So the DOL model notice actually just combined those forms into, or those notices into a single notice. Uh, and so the model general notice and election notice, this would be used for notifying federal COBRA qualified beneficiaries who have had qualifying events occurring from April 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2021. It includes standard COBRA information, uh, an explanation of the subsidy, a COBRA election form, and then additionally, if you're if you are giving people the option to switch to a lower cost option during that 90 day period, this would include the form that participants would use to make that switch. Um, and as I said, you have to attach the summary of the COBRA premium assistance provisions and the accompanying forms that we just talked about to this notice. Um, the next model notice that we have is the model notice used in connection with extended election periods. So, um, and again, this is also still for federal COBRA. So this is for use in notifying subsidy eligible individuals who are currently enrolled in COBRA and um, the second chance individuals. And it includes, similar to the, the notice we just discussed, it includes standard COBRA information, um, ARPA subsidy information, COBRA election form, and the um, optional form for switching coverage if that's allowed. Again, have to attach the summary and the accompanying forms. Um, Kim mentioned earlier that there are some potential gaps or issues with some of these forms. One such gap is that the, the election form does not ask for the desired start date for COBRA coverage. So as we've discussed, in some cases, people will have two options for a start date. In some cases, these second chance individuals are going to have three options for a start date. The COBRA forms do not address this at all. So somehow that's going to have to be addressed either by, you know, following up with participants after they send in their form or um, trying to deal with it on the front end by modifying these forms before you send them out. Um, and yeah, we talked about it. it doesn't address the impact of the COVID-19 relief. So we don't have any information in there about the ability for some of these second chance individuals to retroactively elect coverage back to the date that they lost coverage. 
All right. And then there is a there is also a model form that the DOL um, produced for use in notifying subsidy eligible individuals who are eligible for coverage under the state mini COBRA laws. Um, and this would apply to individuals who are already enrolled in continuation coverage and those becoming eligible for continuation coverage um, during the subsidy period. It, it includes the similar type of information and forms. Uh, again, you're supposed to attach the summary of Co COBRA premium assistance provisions and accompanying forms to this notice as well. There aren't uh, special summary and, um, and election forms that are tailored specifically to the, the non-federal COBRA, so it's just the same forms that you would be attaching. And so here we have just kind of a, a timeline or an example of how the, the notices might flow. Um, and how elections might be made. So plan administrators are going to have to provide the COBRA election notice by May 31st. And depending on um, what group individuals fall in, fall into, they're gonna get different notices. So either they'll get that um, model general notice and election form, they'll get the, um, the extended election period form, or they'll get the alternative notice for state continuation. Um, employee or individual gets the form, qualified beneficiary completes the request for treatment as an assistance eligible individual and the other necessary forms, whatever might be required for that individual. They'll return it um, within 60 days of the notice. If they do that then they'll, the, and they're you know otherwise eligible, then they'll qualify for the subsidy. And then no, as I think, we discuss, Beth, I'm gonna just jump in right there because so clearly we have forms um, you know, a lot of times uh, COBRA administrators take COBRA elections over the phone or through a website. Um, you know, there's there's no sort of mention of that in the DOL guidance or in the notice. So, you know, our COBRA administrator is going to have to start taking all of these in paper, which we may want if we need to then defend our ability to take a tax credit. We need to have that form that said, no, yes, I'm I'm not eligible for other coverage. I think I am eligible for this. So, um, you know, pending other guidance from the DOL, it looks like, you know, paper may be the way we have to go. And interestingly, there's no sort of mention in the form. There's, there's a box at the bottom of the form where the employer can say, you know, we've approved or we've disapproved this application for the subsidy. But there's no process mapped out. You know, what happens if an employee submits an application feels like they were involuntarily terminated and the employer disagrees and the employer says no I think you were you voluntarily terminated there's no appeal process set out there's no um, I, I, th I think it's an open question as to how do we deal with a situation like that yeah um, and then we're getting a lot of questions I'm just seeing so I'm gonna kind of <laughs> we so you have to provide the um, notice of subsidy expiration as we noted um, at least 45 days, no less than 15 days before the subsidy is to expire. And then once um, individuals lose that subsidy, they may have special enrollment rights through uh, the marketplace um, or through other group health plans under HIPAA. Right. So then we'll turn now to interaction of how the COBRA subsidies and the outbreak period deadline extensions work together. And just as a refresher, under guidance that we got from the IRS and the DOL, the following COBRA deadlines are told, which means when we're determining when a deadline falls, you know, we've got a 60-day deadline for making a COBRA election. We start that clock running on the day that the, the COBRA election notice is provided, and then we stop that clock, we pause it at, on the first day of the outbreak period. Or if we're in the outbreak period, when our clock would otherwise start, we don't start it until the end of the outbreak period. Um, we received some recent guidance from the DOL that said, well, yes, that's true. Our, our clock must stay stopped during the outbreak period, but we can't stop the clock for more than a year. So then if a year passes, we start the clock again. If a year doesn't pass, if the outbreak period ends first, we start the clock at the end of the outbreak period. So that's going to apply that, that concept to a qualified beneficiary's obligation to notify the plan about a, a qualifying event that's a divorce, legal separation, child aging out, that applies to the um, participants 
COBRA election deadline, and it applies to the participant's payment deadline for making COBRA payments. So that outbreak period began March 1 of 2020, and it's going to end 60 days after the end of the national emergency. And at this point in time, we have no idea when that end will be. So thankfully, this subsidy guidance provides that these outbreak period deadline extensions do not apply to deadlines that are specific to the subsidy. Um, but they still apply generally to a participant's right to elect COBRA coverage. So even if a participant who failed to elect COBRA coverage within 60 days of the date they received their election notice, you know, if that occurred during the outbreak period, they're still technically in their COBRA election period. And so second chance individuals you know, would have an opportunity to choose. Do we want retroactive coverage or do we want it prospectively going forward? So let's look at an example of how this would work. So let's say our friend Amy again was involuntarily terminated on October 15th, 2020. So that is right smack dab in the middle of the outbreak period. Uh, she lost coverage under a plan that's subject only to federal COBRA. She's, she's got an 18 month COBRA period. Had she elected COBRA, it would have been effective from November 1, 2020 through April 30th, 2022. So as long as Amy's not eligible for other group health plan coverage or Medicare on April 1, she can elect into free COBRA coverage for the subsidy period, April 1 through September 30. Now, she can do that choice April 1 forward or date of her election forward. But because she's still in her outbreak period election period, she could instead choose to take that coverage retroactively back to November 1 of 2020. Now, she'd be obligated to pay her premiums for that period of time, but that is a choice that's available to her. Now, Different example, let's say Jill was also involuntarily terminated on October 15th, 2020, and lost coverage under a plan that was subject only to federal COBRA. But Jill did elect COBRA, effective November 1, 2020, and she paid her first few months of premiums, but she stopped paying. And the way her plan works, if you don't make your payments by the first day of the month, coverage is suspended. Um, and then it would be retroactively reinstated once you make your payments. Well, she's still in her outbreak period extension period. So she hasn't lost her ability to enroll in COBRA because she's still in her, her grace period, essentially. And so if she still makes her payments, she could get that coverage back retroactively to um, the date she last paid for it. Right now, under the terms of her plan, her coverage ran through the end of January, which was the last date of payment, and the rest of the coverage is suspended. As a second chance individual, she can then elect in. And she can elect in as of April 1, which means she makes her coverage effective April 1, and she has no coverage or obligation to pay for coverage between February 1 and March 31 of 2021. So she can actually have a gap in coverage as a second chance individual at this point in time. So that's gonna turn us now to some open questions. We've gone through a, a summary of what we know from the DOL guidance, but there's so much more that we feel like we need to nail down. So Beth, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the first one. Sure, so um, as Kim noted earlier in the presentation, there's a lot of um, confusion about what involuntary, involuntary termination actually means. We may get some guidance from the IRS that clarifies some of this, but likely uh, we're still gonna be in a position of having to just make a reasonable decision with respect to some of this. So, Things that may qualify as involuntary termination that we're not sure of, termination of employment due to disability. Now, the, the guidance that we got from the IRS um, in 2009 with respect to the RS subsidy did indicate that they would consider termination due to someone being on disability leave for an extended period of time, that that would be an involuntary termination. So we may get similar guidance. Um, Termination of employment due to death. As Kim noted in the 2009 guidance, the IRS did not view that as an involuntary termination that would uh, make someone eligible for um, the subsidy. Failure to renew an employment contract. Um, employee election to take an early retirement package. Employee resignation due to good reason. So as you'll see, you know, once we start to dig into this, there are a lot of circumstances where it's not necessarily a clear cut voluntary versus involuntary right and the guidance we got from 2009 essentially said if the employee was ready willing and able to continue in employment and the employer said no 
then that would be an involuntary termination of employment. But they also said to look at the facts and circumstances. So an employee might have said, you know, I'm raising my hand, I want to retire, I want to quit. But it's because they knew if they didn't that the employer was going to terminate their employment. And so in a circumstance like that, where it may have been coded as a voluntary termination, the employee may have said, I resign, that might be considered an involuntary termination for purposes of the COBRA subsidy. Another question, if an individual is generally eligible for other group health plan coverage, but they're not able to enroll now because it's the middle of the year, does that make them ineligible for the subsidy? So let's look at this example. Let's say Bill was laid off in November of 2019 and his health coverage was terminated at the end of that month, you know, November. Now, Bill was eligible for, but didn't elect COBRA. He's a second chance individual, right? He's, he could still have COBRA in 2021. But Bill's spouse had coverage through her employer, and she could have enrolled Bill as her dependent, but chose not to do so. Is Bill now eligible to elect subsidized COBRA? Well, you know, his termination of employment was, was back in 2019. There was multiple opportunities, a couple different open enrollment periods where she could have enrolled him. Now she's in the middle of a plan year and there's no mid-year election change event. This, this, this COBRA subsidy opportunity, the IRS hasn't told us that that's a new mid-year election change event. So is he eligible? Is he not eligible? You know, under the guidance we got in 2009, it would seem to be that he is not eligible for this other coverage, and so he would not be disqualified from the subsidy. But what if the spouse's employer elected the Consolidated Appropriations Act mid-year election change relief? You know, under that relief, an employer can allow people to make changes to their medical dental vision coverage you know, in the middle of a year without a qualifying life event, regardless of the reason. If the spouse's employer elected that relief, and would allow the spouse to enroll Bill at any time, maybe then he is eligible because he can get into the plan. Now, let's take a different example. Let's say instead of terminated back in 2019, he terminated in 2020. That's during the outbreak period. And his loss of coverage would entitle his spouse to a HIPAA special enrollment right to enroll Bill in her employer's plan. And because we're still in the outbreak period, that HIPAA special enrollment opportunity is still open. And so then it would seem that he is, you know, still eligible to get into the plan. He's able to get in the plan. That would seem like he would be eligible for that coverage and then therefore ineligible for the subsidy. All right. And so um, another question, we, we've talked a little bit about the DOL's clarification that an otherwise individual will not lose eligibility for the COBRA subsidy if they switch to a lower cost coverage option. Um, but as we know, there are situations where, again, it's not as, it's not going to be as clean cut as that because plans may have completely switched their plan design. Um, they may have gone through acquisitions. Uh, and as a result, the option that somebody was enrolled in at the time of the qualified event may not even be available later on. So we've got some examples um, of when, uh, you know, when might this come into play? First example is intervening annual enrollment. So we have Jim, he was terminated last February. He enrolled in COBRA coverage in March of 2020. During open enrollment in November, 2020, he decided to enroll in a more expensive PPO option. Obviously that, that was before the COBRA subsidy was even enacted. Um, so the question now is, is Jim eligible for a subsidy for that coverage? for the more expensive coverage that he elected back during open enrollment, is he eligible now, even though it's more expensive than the option that he was enrolled in at the time of his qualifying event? And I think, you know, the likely, um, the intent was not to make Jim ineligible for a subsidy, and hopefully we'll get some guidance on that from the IRS, but, it might be that Jim, you know, has to switch back to that less expensive option in order to qualify for the subsidy. Um, additional example, like I was just talking about, where we have a, the, a situation where the original plan coverage is no longer available. So Barb was terminated by company A in January 2020. At the time of her termination, Barb had coverage under an inexpensive HDHP plan 
She didn't elect Cobra. In May of 2020, Company B purchases Company A. And Company B then terminates Company A's health plan, and Company A became a participant in Company B's plan. Company B's plan doesn't offer any HDHP option. The only thing they offer are more expensive PPO options. Well, Barb now qualifies as a second chance individual, and she has the ability to elect back into COBRA, but the only options that are available to her are more expensive coverage options. Again, I doubt that the intent was that Barb would be ineligible for a subsidy in this situation, um, but we, we don't have clear guidance on that yet. Next open question deals with second chance individuals. You know, does the second chance enrollment opportunity apply to individuals whose original COBRA period was extended due to a disability or a second qualifying event? So for example, Let's say Amy was involuntarily terminated on October 15th, 2018, when she and her spouse lost coverage under a plan that was subject only to federal COBRA. So she's got the 18 month period. If she had elected COBRA, it would have been effective November 1, 2018 through April 30th, 2020. Clearly not within the subsidy period. She is clearly not a second chance individual. But what if Amy and her spouse divorce in June of 2019? You know, they're not on COBRA but they divorce, and if they had been on COBRA at the time, and if the ex-spouse had provided timely notice, that ex-spouse would have been entitled to an extension of COBRA coverage for an additional 18 months, which would have taken him through into the subsidy period. So is that ex-spouse a second chance individual? Does the employer have to send a notice to that ex-spouse to let the ex-spouse know about the ability to enroll? Um, I, it, it's a question that has not yet been addressed in guidance. Hopefully the IRS will, will address it. If the 2009 guidance is any indication, probably not. There's probably not going to be uh, a requirement to notify this ex-spouse or to give them an opportunity for the subsidy. Now, had the spouse been on COBRA coverage, then the spouse would have been entitled to the subsidy, assuming the spouse was not eligible for other employer provided group health plan coverage or Medicare. Now contrast that with an individual, let's say if, if Amy had terminated employment and was entitled to a disability extension and the, the 19 through 29 months disability extension falls within the subsidy period, does that make her a second chance individual? So she's not in her 18 months, but she is in her extended disability period. Um, we think most likely that, that Amy would be a second chance individual, that there'd be an obligation to provide her notice and give her an opportunity to elect but we're waiting on that IRS guidance to confirm. And then we have a number of open questions related to the payroll tax credit, uh, which is squarely within the IRS's purview. So hopefully their guidance will address some of these questions. But um, I think Kim mentioned all of these, but again, with respect to that administrative fee, is it going to be possible for uh, plan sponsors to claim a tax credit for that 2% administrative fee? Um, to what extent can an employer claim a tax credit if the employer voluntarily subsidizes some portion of the coverage already through a severance agreement? It seems from the language of the statute that probably the employer is only going to be able to um, claim a tax credit for the portion that the employee otherwise would have had to pay. Um, but you know, maybe we'll get some differing guidance on that from the IRS. Uh, what happens is if an employer disagrees with an individual's characterization of a termination of involuntary? Kim talked about that already. You know, there, there are questions about at what stage do you address that? So do you address it when the individual originally files their um, tax or their COBRA subsidy um, treatment as a premium assistance eligible individual form? and they claim on there that it was an in, involuntary termination, if the employer disagrees, is that something the employer needs to address then? Does the employer just let that person get a subsidy, but then maybe decide they're not gonna file for a tax credit for that individual if it's not clear whether it's involuntary? So hopefully we'll get some, some information on that from the IRS. Great. So that takes us to our next steps and issues to consider, you know, while we're waiting for this IRS guidance. Um, 
it's not too early to start trying to figure out who are your second chance individuals. Who are those individuals who lost health coverage due to a reduction in hours or an involuntary termination of employment? Following the guidance that we had in 2009 as to what, what is involuntary termination, where the employer unilaterally terminated the employment or the employee volu voluntarily did knowing that there was writing on the wall or, or for good reason. Uh, so you'll want to understand what, you know, what termination codes have been used in the past so that you know sort of what report to run. And are those termination codes going to be sufficient to tell you the whole story as to whether somebody was involuntarily terminated or not? You also want to consider how far back to look. So we know we, you would look back at least 18 months. We're going at least back to terminations in October of 2019, but then also may need additional time for folks who are uh, on a disability extension. And, you know, cross our fingers, the IRS guidance doesn't come out this way, potentially also, you know, the second qualifying event individuals. Uh, clearly, you want to coordinate with your COBRA vendor regarding, you know, how the notices are going to be provided, who they're going to be provided to, when they're going to be provided. Uh, and you want to prepare for receipt of those requests for treatment as an assistance eligible individual forms that those participants must submit. Um, you know, make sure you've got the right documentation to support uh, any payroll tax credit that you're going to take. Issues to consider, you know, do you want to allow your assistance eligible individuals to switch down into a lower health plan option? Uh, if it turns out that you can't take the full payroll tax credit for COBRA coverage that's been voluntarily subsidized by the company, you know, to what extent do you want to amend your severance practices going forward to maybe cease providing that subsidy? Uh, and then, of course, potential impact on claims experience. While the government is going to be paying us back for the premiums, that the employee is not paying. The government is not paying us back for the cost of medical expenses that are being incurred by these individuals during this period of coverage. So uh, definitely keep in mind that this, this, is, this is not a complete wash from a uh, subsidy perspective. So with that, we will turn our attention now to some Q&As. And Beth, I don't know if you were able to take a look at one while we were finishing up that last section. Yeah, we have, we have a number. So I can just start from the top if you'd like. Um, the first question that we got was with respect to eligibility, what about a dependent child who is turning 26 who does not have other coverage available? So a, a dependent child turning 26, that is a COBRA qualifying event, but it's not an event that would trigger mm -hmm. subsidy eligibility. So um, that you wouldn't have to worry about. It would only be dependents of um, employees who are losing coverage due to the employee's involuntary termination or due to a reduction in hours. Okay. So next question, let's say someone voluntarily decides to semi-retire and reduce their working hours to 20 hours a week. And because of that, they've lost eligibility for health coverage. Would they be subsidy eligible? Uh, and I think the answer to that is yes, because they haven't, although we've said, you know, semi-retire, they haven't terminated employment. They've reduced their hours and they've lost their coverage because they've reduced their hours. Even though that was a voluntary choice, that loss of coverage due to a reduction in hours would allow them to be a subsidy eligible individual. Okay, next question. If the company subsidizes COBRA when an employee is on a severance agreement, does that count as other group health plan coverage? So if we're talking about the same company, if we're talking about, you know, company A terminates someone, gives them subsidized COBRA under a severance agreement, um, and then the question is, does that company need to notify that individual of the potential eligibility for a COBRA subsidy from that company's health plan? You still probably have to send a notice. If you're fully subsidizing, coverage already and that and that coverage that you're providing extends throughout the entire COBRA subsidy period, then there really isn't going to be a need for the individual to elect a COBRA subsidy because there's there's no portion of a premium that the federal subsidy would apply to. Um, if we're talking about two different companies, so you're wondering if you need to provide notice to perhaps a second chance individual who was terminated by a different company last year um, and um, you know then employed by you and then terminated by you. If they're receiving any sort of group health coverage from another company, 
then yes, that's going to that's going to constitute uh, other group health coverage. It, I should specify if they're receiving any other major medical coverage. Yes, that'll make them ineligible for a COBRA. Okay. Next question. Let's say somebody went to the marketplace and purchased a policy there because it was cheaper than COBRA coverage. Could they drop their marketplace policy and enroll in COBRA coverage? Yes, assuming they were a second chance individual, so they lost their coverage due to an involuntary termination of employment or reduction in hours, and they're not otherwise eligible for other employer-provided group health plan coverage or Medicare, um, they could drop their marketplace coverage, pick up COBRA coverage, and, and qualify for the subsidy. Now, the marketplace coverage can't be dropped retroactively, so they could drop it at the end of a month, which may be why they want to elect you know, back if they're a second chance individual, back into COBRA coverage prospectively from the date of the election, as opposed to retroactively back to April 1. Now, if they're in the marketplace and they don't have the tax credit, you know, there wouldn't be any problem with electing co COBRA coverage back to April 1. There would just be duplicate coverage that would then need to coordinate. But if they got that tax credit for the marketplace policy, you know, they wouldn't want, be wanting to do the retroactive coverage because that would have disqualified from the from the tax credit and they're going to owe money back to the government. So um, a little bit of coordination there. And Kim, I think the next question is actually a version of that same question. So I'm going to skip the next question. Um, question after that, what if the employer no longer has the plans that were offered back in 2019 and that employer has totally different plans? So again, we kind of talked about that as far as it being an open question with this issue of switching coverage to a less expensive or more expensive option, not quite sure how that will play out. Um, if you have totally different plans, but there's a plan option that would be sort of analogous to what the individual had when they um, experienced their qualifying event, then likely that would be the, the default that you would enroll them in. And, and your argument would be that, you know, this is, the closest thing that you have to the coverage that was in place when they originally lost coverage. Next question is, do we know what the penalties will be for an employer that fails to provide notice? Um, it, it's my understanding that they are the general COBRA penalties. So that would be a self-reportable excise tax generally equal to $100 per affected individual per day until the issue is corrected. All right. And next question, um, if the employer provided a lump sum payment to cover three months of COBRA, would the individual still be eligible for the subsidy? So in that scenario, it, it sort of depends on the timing, right? So let's say that the individual was terminated effective April 1st. They're given a three month lump sum um, to cover the um, COBRA premium for the first three months in that case then they would still be potentially eligible for the subsidy after that three month period assuming they're you know still cobra eligible at that point and that they're not eligible for other group health plan coverage you know beth i wonder about that one though does it depend on how because if, if we're providing a lump sum mm -hmm. we're not tying that we're not paying the plan cobra administrator like for yes. premiums in advance we're mm -hmm. paying the employee a lump sum, which they could then theoretically use for any purpose. We're not asking for proof that they've paid their COBRA premiums. You know, that lump sum, I would imagine, would not be considered a, a voluntary subsidy. Um, yeah, it, I, I don't know. I sort of look at it as you, I guess it would depend somewhat on how the severance agreement is termed or um, drafted, but I, would look at that as you're giving them that three month lump sum based on the good faith understanding that they'll be using that for COBRA. Um, I would, you know, it, it, it would all shake out on the employer's end as far as filing a premium tax credit. I'm not sure that I would feel comfortable filing for a premium tax credit for the three months for which I provided a subsidy under the severance agreement. Although I think if you wanted to take an aggressive position that you could make that argument. Yeah. And I think we should definitely watch for IRS guidance on that because I do recall in the 2009 guidance, there were some different examples of, you know, if you subsidize the coverage, you know, what does that mean for your tax credit? 
Um, and I do know that there's at least one industry organization that said to the IRS, hey, this is different than 2009 because this is a full subsidy, whereas 2009 was a partial subsidy. We think that there would be a reason not to treat an employer differently based on a voluntary subsidy here in 2021. So definitely keep an eye on IRS guidance when it comes to subsidi voluntarily subsidized COBRA coverage. Uh, so that brings us then to our uh, the end of our hour. We have a number of questions left. If you submitted a question and we didn't get to it, reach out to your Thompson Hine attorney, or if you have a question that you didn't submit, reach out to your Thompson Hine attorney, um, you know, see if they can help you. If you don't have a Thompson Hine attorney, contact one of us and we'll figure out a way uh, what makes sense to help answer your question. I uh, do want to let you know that, again, we will be sending out a copy of the slides and a recording of the presentation within two business days. We want to thank you all for your time and attention and have a good day.